I wanted just to share a little bit of my context. I could go on a, a little bit, but these are just little prompts to help me. Um, as Steve mentioned, I'm, I'm married and I'm a, a husband and father of four. Uh, my wife and I have also been foster parents um, for the last uh, eight, nine years and fostered a number of children in our home. Um, I've told people before that being a, being a husband and a, and a father are two of the things, the only things I know about in terms of my own vocation, like that I am confident about. Everything else is still up for grabs. <laughs> so um, I, I put this image of us whitewater rafting there um, uh, as a family, uh, partly because uh, I think we live in a whitewater world, right, where things are moving um, very quickly all the time. Um, I also, with, re with regards to the liquid image, if some of you have read Ed Foley's work on reflective believing, he talks a little bit about this notion of liquidity, right, of being in a, a liquid and moving and constantly changing um, reality. Uh, one that is not like the static tradition that we've pass on from generation to generation to generation. This is more about the dynamic, ongoing movement of the spirit in the life of God's people. Um, I put the image of a young adult there with the idea. I've been working with young adults in some capacity for about the last 25 years. Uh, my time uh, at Amate House um, before going to DePaul and then working at DePaul for the last 14 years. So that's been a big part of my journey. And as any of you know, um, you know, there's the line that says you, you sort of teach what you most need to learn or something like that, that idea. Um, I know that I'm still actively living out and trying to understand my own young adult experience in my work with, my, with current young adults. Um, uh, I put the image of Pew, the Pew Forum up there um, simply because it's, just a reality that pretty much I, I have to, not have to, I deal with all the time at DePaul. I am uh, undeniably, can, can very much convinced about the reality of religious disaffiliation, at least from traditional religious practice among um, most of the young people that I tend to deal with. Um, and it's, uh, I think, a sociological reality that is kind of like the rising of a tide um, it's not something that we can say we, we don't like it or let's throw a few sandbags up. Like it, No, it's happening and it's not something that we can change or control. Um, it just is the reality. Um, DePaul's, as you may know, the largest Catholic university uh, in the United States. Uh, and the second is actually our sister school, St. John's in New York, um, another Vincentian school. Um, we have a particular mission uh, as a Catholic institution. Um, you know, of the, I think it's 200 some odd Catholic institutions in the United States of higher education, there's quite a range in terms of how people approach their Catholic identity and mission. And DePaul from the very beginning has a very particular mission. Um, you know, we always say there's, it's written into our charter that there will be no religious litmus test, essentially for, for people to attend or participate or be part of the DePaul community. And that was because of discrimination against immigrants, Catholics, and Jews at the time. Um, so it, I always say it's in our DNA to be inclusive, to be welcoming, um, to be a very diverse environment, and that's a part of who we are. Um, so I've uh, come to be strongly resonant with uh, uh, the life and wisdom and spirituality of Vincent de Paul. Um, I didn't know I, how Vincentian I was in my own spirituality and way of thinking uh, until I went to DePaul, and it, it's just because there's such a strong resonance with, with my own and who I am uh, as a person. So I uh, want to just, again, in the, in the light of sort of my, putting my social location out there, where I'm coming from, um, I'm really grateful to Steve Bevins uh, over the years uh, for conversations um, I've had with him. And it actually got me to see to you in the first place to say, you know, I really actually think my job has a lot. It's missiology, uh, it, my work at DePaul, um, and understanding that. And his you know, notion, for example, of this idea of prophetic dialogue, 
um, as a model uh, as well. But I just put a few um, scriptural references up there that have meant something to me at some point in my life. And one is this from Isaiah that says, it's too little, he says, for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will make you a light to the nations. In other words, it's too little for you to focus on just building up the institutional church. Your mission's bigger than that, right? That's the way I have thought about it. Um, you're, not, you're thinking too small. Um, there's a, uh, uh, some of you may know Sharon Delos Parks of that name. She wrote a book called Big Questions, Worthy Dreams about young adult faith spirituality. And she says that part of what we need to do with young adults is ask big enough questions Right, and invite them to find a dream worthy of a lifetime. Right, I, I think sometimes we think too small uh, and invite them not to dreams that aren't big enough. Um, this line from Luke is, uh, was Vincent's favorite, right, and, and what Vincent de Paul founded the Vincentians on this notion of the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, right, that this is a mission uh, to announce the good news to the poor. Uh, and the last one is just this, you know, as we think about um, the lives of those we interact with, y young adults, you know, this whole thing of not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those that do the will of my Father. So that this notion of, of let's talk about what we do uh, and not about what we say, right? Um, so... Uh, I want to talk a little bit basically about the project I'm working on with my D-men uh, work with Steve, and, and, I, and again, I hope it's helpful for you. I know it's not everyone's, it doesn't have this, share the same context, but it's something that I have actively wrestled with for a number of years, and I just hope that I can share some of the, what's come out of that for me. Uh, it started with a mission committee of our board of trustees. Um, which I go to every once in a while to talk about what we're doing in my area of mission and ministry. And DePaul, at the time, was over 24,000 students. Um, you know, I was talking about the several hundred up to maybe 1,000 students we serve, and one of the members said, well, what about the other 23,000? Um, what are you doing for them? Uh, and it, it's, it sparked some, some serious thinking and conversation um, with me and my team, and it was particularly about the, the disaffiliation of young people in the sense that, well, not everybody's, you know, going to uh, jump in the boat in terms of the, the traditional models of campus ministry. So what are you doing? How are you engaging them? Um, the other question that's kind of sparked me is this, I put a number out there because our current president has been asking this question about what will we look like in 2030? And I mentioned the sea change in the, the Pew reports say uh, if, if we look out 12 years from now and we think about what our church and what our society and w w will look like uh, 12 years from now, uh, it's going to be different, right? Uh, I know in our Vincentian sponsorship of the university, um, there's not, there aren't young people coming in. So they're only going to be 12 years older, the community and probably much fewer, and their presence at DePaul will be much less. So how we think about mission and how we think about carrying forward our Catholic Vincentian identity and mission, we have to take that reality seriously. Um, I was really um, moved by Dan's comments about the, the pre-synodal meeting, and I, 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 I have to admit I read it over, but not with such the care that Dan did and, and drawing us to really listen to those voices. Um, uh, there's this line in there that says, young people look for a sense of self by seeking communities that are supportive, uplifting, authentic, and accessible communities that empower them. There's so much in what Dan said and in, in, in the comments that, that I, I don't think I have time to, to go over all of them, um, but that the word authenticity rings very clearly, um, and uh, many of the things that they ask for, you know, the, the controversial issues and the things that are pushing are very resonant with my experience. Um, in my own thinking, part of what, what we can do, right, DePaul's, again, 23,000 students, um, uh, about a third are Catholic, um, so I always say that means two-thirds are not, 
right? And probably the largest, I was someone commented the other day, the largest population of students are none, and I think maybe the second is other, which we don't know what it means. But <laughs> so, so the question is, what do we have to offer, right, as a Catholic Vincentian institution, or what must we do, as we say is the Vincentian question, what must be done? Uh, and with this question of what about the other 23,000, where I've kind of landed a bit is this notion that, that vocation, this theology of vocation, right, this idea of vocation is a gift uh, from our church for the human community that we can share. It's something that's accessible. It's something that meets students, young people where they are. Um, the language can sometimes be a barrier. So it's something we've played around with. The word vocation, tough, doesn't really work. The concept behind it does, right? Students want to authentically consider um, who they are and how they bring their gifts and talents uh, to contribute to the broader world. Um, so vocation, actually, the theology of vocation holds a lot of what our church's mission is about. It kind of holds it all together in a, in a nice little package, if you will. Um, it just has to be broken down in language that's accessible to young people. Um, I uh, w have been talking to a lot of people at DePaul about this, and um, somebody in our writing center uh, who I was talking about it said, um, told me this, that sounds like vocation is a threshold concept. Uh, and I said, what's a threshold concept? And she pointed me to this um, research that's been done that in different fields of study or practices in medicine or in chemistry or whatever, there's these concepts that people in the field have to learn, and once you learn them, it sort of opens you up into that particular field of study, right? You can't kind of go further until you get the basics down. And I think if we think about vocation as a threshold concept, it opens up some possibilities for us. Um, that once someone understands or get, gains a sense of vocation, and again, I don't even, I don't care, honestly, if they call it that or not, but once they get the, the fundamentals of what we're talking about when we talk about vocation, it opens up some needs and desires for the kinds of things that we wanna do with our young people. Um, practice reflection and mindfulness, prayer and discernment, and get them into meaningful conversation about purpose. Um, there was a study done, I think in the 2008, I'm guessing 10 years ago, um, that used this notion uh, with regards to young adults and their identification with religion and said that it, a good word to describe it is it's, be, it's being eclipsed by other concerns, right? So a lot of times we found y young people are not necessarily interested and engaged in traditional religious practice or involvement. Um, because it's eclipsed by other concerns, right? It's eclipsed by their need to figure out where they're going in their life, you know, what they're going to be doing in terms of a career. It's by their friendships, by uh, other financial concerns, by uh, concerns about their own identity and who they are. Some of that gets e eclipsed and gets put behind. But I think um, I was thinking with the song this morning, um, of this line of learning to trust our theological anthropology, right? This trust the goodness of creation, trust the spirit strong within was the line from the song. Um, it's clear to me that I engage people from a variety of different faith backgrounds and otherwise that young people are longing for a sense of vocation, right? That, and I think that that's a part of how we understand uh, who we are as human people from a faith tradition, but it, it transcends just who we are in the church. Um, so what are some of the underlying, you know, fundamentals of vocation so that, again, I mentioned the word can sometimes trip people up. In our Catholic circles, people immediately think it's about religious life or priesthood because that's what we talk about. Um, we haven't reached that point where um, we talk about vocation more broadly, which is what I'm trying to encourage us to think about today. Um, but can we talk about the underlying fundamentals of what vocation is about and sort of prepare the soil um, for conversations that can go, go on more deeply? 
I wanted to just ask people to pause at, at this point to really think about the young people in your life. And I don't mean the people that you're seeing because they're considering vocation to priesthood or religious life. I mean, like maybe your next door neighbor or somebody in your extended family and think about those young people honestly. Um, what do you think are their present hopes, dreams? Where are they, where are they living? Where's their, what occupies their attention? Um, what do they care about? What are they committed to? You know, I think Dan did a nice job of drawing us back to that document and drawing us back to say, we, we have to take this seriously. Um, and the bottom line is increasingly they're not in the church, right? They're not in the institutional church, the traditional practices. They're elsewhere. Uh, and my guess is, I can say confidently, just because I, I actually think the sociological data is pretty valid, that if we all thought about that a little bit, probably the percentages of young people that we know in our lives would reflect what the Pew reports are kind of telling us, which is that most are nuns or others or still trying to figure out who they are. Most are disengaged uh, with traditional religious practices. Um, I was talking last night. This is my son. Uh, I was sharing last night um, that it's granted it's what I'm going through right now, but I have a 17-year-old son with whom we've had some struggles um, over the last year, um, not for any other reason than he's just a, t a, a teenage kid. Um, but part of that journey has been coming to understand the gift that he is to me and to us. Um, and it's been a journey that's involved a great deal of challenge and grief, some loss of what my expectations were or hopes. Um, and it just occurred to me yesterday, I was commenting with the Steves and Dan back there, that um, I think there's a parallel with our church and with church leadership and our ability to meet young people where they are. Um, when I think about, was reflecting again just this morning, I just added this because I think there's, there's such a parallel of the gifts that I think he's brought to me and to my life um, that I was and has been and still am to some degree resistant to. I feel it in myself. Right? It's hard because it involves change. It involves loss. Um, but when I think about his ability to appreciate beauty and joy and want that in his life and live it, right? Uh, his gifts are different. They're not the traditional ones. I have two older girls that just, you know, as I say, followed the system, right? <laughs> and they went along with it, and it was all real easy. His, his gifts are different. Um, you know, he's willing to to uh, be vulnerable and authentic in a way that's disarming, completely disarming. I, I, um, I would think that generally I'm pretty good at that, and he's way better at that than I am, <laughs> at just being perfectly authentic and want that from me. And again, it's not that he wants to reject me and what I have to offer. He actually wants me to walk with him but to be authentic in that journey and to have us walk together into what's unknown, right? That we're gonna go together. Um, so very much about learning, he wants to know my story and he wants me to know his story, right? Um, he asks critical questions and if anything, he does not wanna be predefined or put into a box, some preconceived notion. And it just occurred to me that I think if we really meet young people as the pre-synodal document is talking about. Um, that's the kind of thing that it takes, and it's, it's challenging for those of us, you know, who have notions and expectations about what should be, right, in our church. Um, so I'm just going to um, ask this intentionally provocative question, and I know we have more than vocation directors here. But I want to ask in light of just a few of the things I've said, um, and, and this goes to me too when I think of what is the work of mission at an institution, but what's the vocation of the vocation director? Um, 
Now, I was thinking another way of saying it is, who do you work for, <laughs> right? Um, you know, if we go back to this thing of the mission has a church or the mission has a congregation, that, you know, but ultimately are we pointing at the mission of Jesus, right? Is that, isn't that ultimately what we're about? And if we're vocation directors or campus ministers or, you know, mission officers at an institution, it's ultimately that's what we want people living is the mission of Jesus. How we get there, um, you know, we're in whitewater times, right? It may require some change in, in ways, the ways we think about things. Uh, I have a, a lot of different thoughts that I can share a little bit more of in the question and answer, but I, I was thinking about this originally um, as a pie and thinking, well, if we expand the pie, then the slice of the pie of people going to religious life would also be bigger, right? And then I thought, you know what, that's the wrong image. And I don't know, won't know what the new one is yet, but it has something to do with this dynamic, changing, interconnected reality where it's not about um, what fits in a pie tin. <laughs> like, this is about this thing that is spilling over all over the place. It's about the spirit that you can't contain that is in all people everywhere, uh, and, and we can't box it in, right? It's exploding, over, over, overflowing. Um, and so I came up with a little image that tries to get at that, and I'm not quite there in terms of what it might be. But um, the, I think the, the idea, if you think about the, the contained image of this pie and whether the pie is shrinking or growing, it's, it's not the right image, right? It's, you got to explode that wide open, um, I think, to get to where we are today. Um, um, some of my um, thinking with my studies have led me to think about this notion of leadership for mission because part of what I'm focusing on is the role of mission about of cultivating mission leadership in the, in the institution. So I just want to share really quickly some brief insights. Some of you know um, the work of Ron Heifetz um, who's done a lot on leadership and there's a couple concepts that I think are really important. Um, one is the difference between a technical problem and an adaptive challenge, right? Technical problems have quick fixes. They have answers to them, right? You can say, oh, if we tweak this a little bit, then it'll fix the problem. Adaptive challenges are completely different. They require a transform transformation in how we think about things and how, how we operate and do things. And he said that the key to leadership is actually distinguishing between what's a technical fix and what's really an adaptive challenge that requires much more. His second concept that I think is really important is the notion of formal leadership versus informal leadership, or formal authority and informal authority. Um, and, and I think informal authority, is it, it has to be in, in your bones and what you do and say and who you are, right? It's, the formal title doesn't work, right? And I think that that's really true, again, as mentioned with young people. This idea, it's more about informal authority and the authority you carry because of who you are and what you live and what you do and the, the witness that you give. The second one, this Mike, Michael Maccabee on the leaders we need, and really quickly, he talks about this notion of social character, right, of a culture. And he said there's been a shift in the social character, and he's talking, I think, specifically about the United States, between a, a hierarchical social character to one that's more like a sibling social character in organizations. So there's been a breakdown of, in companies and uh, business, uh, you know, uh, corporations, the hierarchical model of leadership doesn't work anymore, right? Because um, young people, in particular the millennials and all that, don't respond to that hierarchical model of authority. Theirs is more of a sibling model where a leader is more like an older brother or sister, right? That that you share a lot in common with and you're inviting and can, so there's a, a difference in, in what um, exists kind of in our culture. I've been got attracted to this idea of distributed leadership for, for mission and that's a educational kind of K through 12 sort of book Jim Splain is at Northwestern. Um, but his is this whole idea and it's similar to the next one which is 
Some of you may have seen this book, it's recent, about everyone leads, but that leadership in an institution or in a community needs to be distributed, and it's more about how, um, what goes on amongst all these people that is the leadership. It's not, the, again, the traditional hierarchical, one person's the leader, but actually the leadership that is shared, right? And then how those relationships amongst people that d lead in different times and contexts and places of an institution and how they work to one another, that's, that's how leadership happens. And the last one, and it's a similar notion, is this idea of a community of practice. Um, you know, that I want to just ask the question, what if we were a community of practice for vocation as a church, right? A community of practice for um, mission as a church. Um, that we, a community of practice is, a, is, a, is an, a group of people that work together on a particular profession or a particular craft or a particular um, uh, goal, um, but the, the whole idea is it's done in community and it's done together and you, you, you live and work together and you're constantly in learning mode, right? That, that you're, a community of practice is always learning. It's a learning organization. It's a learning community. Um, so those are just a few thoughts that I have had as I think about, um, you know, again, my role at DePaul uh, is how to, how to cultivate a community or a culture of vocation, right, at the institution, because I think that's what a Catholic university like DePaul can do that we can, we can achieve. We may not be able to catechize 23,000 students or convert them all to Catholicism or do whatever. We're, we're never going to do that. In fact, that never has been and never will be our goal. But we can cultivate a culture of vocation of preparing people to contribute to the mission of Jesus, whether or not they call it that or not, to the work of building a more just, a more loving, a more compassionate, a more inclusive, a more merciful world and human community. And we can do that. And that's kind of what I think my, my ideas are about.